to this committee and formally uh, congratulate Chairman Cole on becoming the new chairman of the committee. We look forward to continuing to work with both of them. I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. We want to welcome our witness, the Honorable Christopher Ray, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, back to this subcommittee. Director Ray, who has nearly 30 years of DOJ and FBI experience dating back to the late 1990s, has served in his current role since August of 2017. In his capacity as director, he oversees an agency of over 35,000 people, including special agents, intelligence analysts, language specialists, scientists, and information technology specialists. The 25 budget request for FBI salaries and expenses is $11.3 billion, with $6.7 billion of that amount, about 60 percent, designated as defense spending. The request amounts to a 6 percent increase above the fiscal 24 enacted level for salaries and expenses. Overall, the FBI budget request includes $119 million in program increases and approximately $700 million in other adjustments, representing the substantial increased cost of continuing the FBI's current activities. In particular, the largest program increase request is for what the FBI has labeled restoration of 2023 national security and law enforcement personnel. This request is for 85.4 million order positions, of which only 60 would be actual agents. The Bureau claims these reductions in function areas. Let's be crystal clear. Cartels continue to flood our streets with fentanyl and poison. Americans are being hurt in record numbers. They're exploiting our southern border and devastating families and communities. Violent crime levels, murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, all too high. There's no question the FBI's mission is more critical than ever. The requested increases in the fiscal 25 budget are significant, and it's my hope that they are fully discussed at today's hearing in relation to many of the issues this country is facing. However, it is no secret that the nation's federal debt stands at approximately $34 trillion. Let me repeat that number, $34 trillion. And hardworking Americans continue to face elevated costs for everyday items. Congress and this committee in particular cannot ignore the unsustainable path that we are on. It's essential that we ensure every dollar appropriated to agencies is spent effectively, efficiently, and appropriately. Anything less would be ignoring our constitutional duty. To that end, our fiscal year 2024 appropriations bill made some difficult yet necessary funding reductions for many agencies, including the FBI. As with all appropriations bills, the fiscal 24 CGS bill was the product of careful consideration and collaboration within Congress. We review budget submissions, call hearings, analyze program increase requests, engage with the agencies, have countless debates, and make final judgment calls. Not everyone will be satisfied with the final appropriated levels, but ever-increasing debt levels require tough decisions. 
Director Ray, we look forward to the opportunity to discuss with you today the President's fiscal year 2025 budget submission for the FBI. We're looking forward to a full conversation on the major cost drivers within this budget request. Beyond the funding implications of the budget request, I'm also interested in the ongoing issues at the FBI that include but not limited to the erosion of public trust in the Bureau. This includes the FBI's overly aggressive tactics, questionable investigative standards, and the overall politicization of the Bureau. Importantly, I also want to ensure we fully explore the grave crisis at our southern border and the FBI's responsibility when it comes to combating the wide range of illegal activities happening at the border that not only impacts the nation's southern states, but the entire country as a whole. I believe the fiscal year 2024 appropriations bill achieved the right balance and represented a step in the right direction with targeted cuts aimed at pushing the Bureau to refocus on its core mission. Mission creep at federal agencies beyond their required duties is a real problem and it must be corrected. I believe in the FBI's mission to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution of our great country. I recognize the challenging yet critical work the agency performs daily, defending the U.S. against terrorists and espionage, combating deadly fentanyl, protecting the nation's children from becoming victims, and more. FBI agents are our nation's defenders, and it's not lost on members of Congress, the, the sacrifices they make to protect our country. To be clear, the FBI's mission is critical to the health of our entire nation. Mr. Ray, once again, we appreciate you being here to answer our questions. We appreciate your hard work on behalf of the American people. <clears throat> Let me now recognize uh, my ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Cartwright, for any remarks you may wish to make. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I join Chairman Rogers in, in thanking uh, our overall Appropriations Chair Kay Granger for her years of dedication and service to this Appropriations Committee uh, and congratulate Chairman Cole as he takes over that very important role. Uh, and I also join Chairman Rogers in uh, welcoming Director Christopher Wray to testify today. As we all know, the FBI does an enormous amount of work to help protect the American people. As a primary law enforcement agency for the U.S. government, the FBI employs roughly 36,000 people in 56 field offices, 350 resident agencies, and several specialized facilities and analytical centers across the country, as well as in over 60 legal attache offices in 80 countries around the world. The FBI works to inv investigate and disrupt crime, including everything from violent gang networks, cyber criminals, white collar crime, human trafficking, and domestic and international terrorism. And I could not agree more with Chairman Rogers as he talks about FBI's mission, including combating opioid and the opioid epidemic, including fentanyl poisonings, that are killing well north of 100,000 people, American citizens, every year. In addition, since Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine last year, the FBI has also successfully worked to disrupt criminal, cyber, and hostile intelligence activities from Russia that endanger Ukraine, our partners, and American citizens. The Biden administration is requesting funding for several FBI initiatives in fiscal year 2025, including investments to restore and enhance the FBI's efforts to combat violent crime and cybercrime and to en enhance the FBI's 
counterintelligence and counterterrorism capabilities, among other initiatives. Director Ray, I look forward to hearing more from you about these and other priorities surrounding the FBI's budget request. Again, I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back to you. Uh, we want now to recognize our witness, Director Ray, for an opening statement. Uh, without objection, uh, his written statement will be entered into the record, and I would ask him that uh, we would like to see him keep his remarks to five minutes or less so we can have additional time for questions. Director Ray. Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Cartwright, members of the committee. I'm proud to be here today representing the roughly 38,000 men and women who make up the FBI. Every day, our people are working relentlessly to outpace our adversaries and to stay ahead of complex and evolving threats. So I'd like to start out by thanking you and the rest of the committee for your support over the years for our efforts to achieve our mission of protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution. At the same time, I also realize the reality of the environment we're in today where so many agencies are dealing with tightening budgets. And this year, the FBI is one of those agencies. With our fiscal year 2024 budget having now come in almost $500 million below what the FBI needs just to sustain our 2023 efforts. And candidly, this could not have come at a worse time. When I sat here last year, I walked through how we were already in a heightened threat environment. Since then, we've seen the threat from foreign terrorists rise to a whole nother level after October 7th. We continue to see the cartels push fentanyl and other dangerous drugs into every corner of the country claiming countless American lives. We've seen a spate of ransomware and other cyber attacks impacting parts of our critical infrastructure and businesses, both large and small. Violent crime, violent crime, which reached alarming levels coming out of the pandemic, remains far too high and is impacting far too many communities. China continues its relentless effort to steal our intellectual property and most valuable information. And that is just scratching the surface. As I look back over my career in law enforcement, I would be hard pressed to think of a time where so many threats to our public safety and national security were so elevated all at once. But that is the case as I sit here today. And while we have always found ways at the FBI to innovate and make the most with what we have, this is by no means a time to let up or dial back. This is a time when we need your support the most. We need all the tools, all the people, and all the resources required to tackle these threats and to keep Americans safe. So to take each of those in turn, the tools, the people, and the resources. First, an absolutely indispensable tool that Congress can give us in our fight against foreign adversaries is the reauthorization of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It is critical in securing our nation, and we are in crunch time with our 702 authority set to expire next week. So let me be clear, failure to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some new kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put Americans' lives at risk. Second, we need people. And I will stack the FBI's workforce up against anyone, anywhere, anytime. They are innovative, they're efficient, they're relentless, they're professionals, they're patriots. And we have been fortunate at the FBI in recent years that our recruiting has gone through the roof. Americans are applying in droves to devote their lives to a career with us protecting others. But we need more positions to be able to bring all the good people we can to the fight, certainly not fewer. Now is not the time to cut back, it's time to lean forward. And third, 
we need resources, which you will see in the 2025 budget, 2025 budget request that we're here today to discuss. So we need funding to protect America from terrorism. I touched on this earlier, but there was already a heightened risk of violence in the United States before October 7th. Since then, we've seen a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations call for attacks against Americans and our allies. And given those calls for action, our most immediate concern has been that individuals or small groups will draw some kind of twisted inspiration from the events in the Middle East to carry out attacks here at home. But now, increasingly concerning, is the potential for a coordinated attack here in the homeland, akin to the ISIS-K attack we saw at the Russia Concert Hall just a couple weeks ago. We also need funding to counter the threat from the People's Republic of China, a government sparing no expense in its quest to hack, lie, cheat, and steal its way to the top as a global superpower and to undermine our democracy and our economic success. We need funding to counter cyber threats, certainly those from China, but also from a crowded field of sophisticated hostile nation states and criminals, nation states like Russia, Iran, North Korea. We need funding to mitigate the range of threats from the border, fentanyl, gangs like MS-13, human trafficking. We need funding to address the violent crime that remains at levels in this country that are still too high. And we need funding to keep going after child predators and to rescue young victims from their tormentors. Now, in all those areas I just mentioned, we're working closely with our partners at all levels of government to achieve our shared goal of keeping our communities safe. Every day, FBI agents, analysts, and professional staff are working shoulder to shoulder with thousands of task force officers from hundreds of different police departments and sheriff's offices all over the country on our FBI-led task forces. On top of that, we provide technology and expertise, valuable investigative leads like DNA matches, and cutting-edge training to law enforcement nationwide to help them protect Americans from harm. So cuts to us are cuts to our partners state and local law enforcement agencies and officers who are on the ground putting themselves in the line of fire, often quite literally. And that is just one way those cuts are going to have real impacts on the American people. So yes, we took a hit in the 2024 budget, but the 2025 budget is a chance to get back on track, to provide the FBI's men and women the tools and the resources the American people need us to have to keep them safe. So thank you again for having me here today and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Director Ray. We will now proceed under the five minute rule with questions for the witness. I'll begin by recognizing myself. Director, as the uh, Bureau observed any improvements in our efforts to dismantle that fentanyl pipeline? And what role can the Bureau play here? So I would say it's a mixed bag. Um, certainly the scourge of fentanyl is still claiming way, way, way too many lives. Uh, and I will tell you that from the FBI's perspective, one of the things that we've been observing is that in our takedown of violent gangs, which is of course something that we're doing all over the country all the time, we are noticing uh, almost without exception now that those takedowns uh, of violent gang members also include seizures of fentanyl. So the fentanyl that's coming from the cartels built on precursors from China uh, ending up all over the United States is often being distributed, of course, by these violent street gangs. So that is one of the things that we're observing. We are trying to do our part. This goes way beyond any one agency and, frankly, beyond law enforcement 
uh, as I know a lot of your efforts recognize. Uh, but some of the things that we at the FBI are doing to try to do our part, I'll mention a few. Uh, our Safe Streets Task Forces uh, are going after the gangs that are distributing so much of this poison. Our organized crime, our TOC, Transnational Organized Crime Task Forces, are going after the cartels. We have close to, I think, close to 400 investigations that go just after cartel leadership. Uh, we also have things like J Code, which is an initiative where we bring together 12 agencies that's focused on the dark web trafficking of fentanyl and other dangerous substances, dismantling uh, dark net marketplaces uh, when we do that. Uh, we have a prescription drug initiative, because of course, especially in certain parts of the country, uh, pill mills and irresponsible uh, prescribers of opioids are a driver of, of much of this epidemic. So we're using our healthcare fraud expertise, for example, to try to go after some of those folks. Uh, we're working uh, with our partners on the other side of the border. Um, and there I would say uh, it's very uneven. We've had some instances where we've had a key arrest, an extradition, a key operation. We're starting to work with vetted teams down there, which is an important uh, effort in the right direction. Uh, but we need much, much more than we're getting uh, from the Mexican government. So I guess I would summarize my answer to your question by saying a lot of things to be encouraged by in terms of the effort and the work that uh, across multiple agencies people are making, but a lot of things to be very, very concerned about. Last year, uh, I guess the last two years in a row, I'll just leave it with this point. The FBI seized enough fentanyl to kill 270 million American people. And that gives you a sense of the scale of what we're up against. When it comes to Mexico, uh, what is the level of cooperation between our law enforcement agencies, especially when it comes to drug trafficking? Are they working with you in Mexico? Absolutely. I think one of the really bright spots that I see in my, uh, especially when I compare it to earlier in my career, is how close the partnerships are across all levels of law enforcement. All the federal agencies, state and local law enforcement is so intertwined in, with today's FBI. Um, foreign law enforcement in a lot of instances, the intelligence community uh, working with law enforcement. So uh, partnerships are in many ways stronger than ever. And that's one of the things that's keeping this from becoming a, an even worse problem. We work with, say, DEA on everything from OCDF strike forces. Uh, we have DEA task force officers on a lot of our task forces uh, and vice versa. We work out at their SOD where there's intelligence sharing. So there's a, a whole range of ways in which we all work together. Uh, obviously, always room for improvement. We're always looking for ways to innovate and take that to the next level. But uh, if there's one bright spot that I can I'm, leave the committee with is that the partnerships among law enforcement are, in my career, uh, the best I've ever seen. Well, is Mexico honoring our law enforcement efforts to, to bring the cartel leaders to justice? As I, I think I said earlier, uneven, uneven. So we've had instances, individual instances of successes, including events significant cartel figures and extraditions, but then uh, the reality is that the, especially the two major cartels, Sinaloa and CJNG, are the drivers of the vast majority of what we're dealing with here, uh, and we need more from the Mexican government. There are instances to be pleased about. We've had a top 10 fugitive, for example, of ours that they helped us arrest and, and send back recently. So there are individual instances that are bright spots, but this is such a big problem. We need consistent, sustained, scalable uh, assistance from them. Well, that border is so open and unchecked, and we're letting in the cartels who not only do drugs, but they do human trafficking and everything else in the book. And uh, my observation is, we're not getting enough cooperation out of the Mexican government on seeking out the cartels. Can you agree or disagree with that? Well, the way I would put it is we certainly need more 
from the Mexican government. Uh, I'm pleased with what we have gotten, but we need a lot more. Mr. Idaho. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. All right. Thank you, Chairman Rogers. And I want to follow up Chairman Rogers' line of questioning, Director Ray. Um, we're getting some cooperation from the Mexican authorities, but we need more. And it's what they are giving us is, is incomplete, is inconsistent. The question is, what can we do? What, what are we doing to encourage their cooperation? What more can we get out of them and what's the best way to approach that? So I think, uh, you know, some, much of this goes beyond sort of the FBI's lane, of course, and other parts of the government. But your opinion I matters. I mindful, mindful of trying to stay in, in my lane. But what I would say is we need their help cracking down on the cartels harder. We need help rooting out labs where the poison is being produced. We need help stopping the, the purchase and, and influx of precursor chemicals from the Chinese uh, from the PRC. So those are a few things. Uh, as far as what more can we do specifically, I would say, again, at the l lower law enforcement kind of working level, uh, there are uh, any number of operations that, that show us what success could look like at scale. Uh, we've now started doing, uh, which is something I'm pleased with, with the, uh, with the Mexicans. We now have a, a sort of vetted law enforcement teams, much like we've been used to do in, uh, and still do in Colombia, you know, kind of going back to the, the, the efforts that we've had with the Colombian government over the years. I think that's a step in the right direction, but it's, it's extraditions, it's sharing of, of information, um, and it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's, the key is having it at a scaled, consistent, sustained level. Um, it's not that there aren't bright spots, but we just, we just need a lot more of it. Now, you mentioned uh, going after the cartels and 400 separate investigations at the FBI involving them. Uh, what about what you just mentioned, interrupting the flow of precursor chemicals from China to Mexico? How many of those investigations center on that effort, and how much more help do you need from the Mexican government on that effort? Well, we certainly need more help from the Mexican government on that part of it. We also, of course, frankly, need the Chinese government to do a heck of a lot more than they're doing. I mean, you have this um, dangerous intersection of increasingly sophisticated Mexican cartels with malicious and unscrupulous actors uh, in the PRC who are all too happy to be supplying the chemicals that then fuel the cartel's production. Um, we are trying to tackle it on a whole bunch of different levels. Uh, our focus, going back over decades, in terms of the FBI's approach to organized crime is to try to look for ways to dismantle the enterprise. Uh, and so that means trying to go after the leadership, whether, whether we're charging them, whether somebody else is charging them. Uh, that means trying to go after their money. A big part of this is going after, after all, this is a profit business for them. So the more we can go after their assets through asset forfeiture and things like that, and, and go after their money launderers. It doesn't work for them if they don't have a bit people to, uh, and institutions to launder their money. So we're trying to kind of tackle the infrastructure around them too, as opposed to just onesie twosies uh, in terms of arrest. So that's the approach we're trying to take, but it, it's a, it's very much has to be a team effort. And do you need more money to do that or less money? We need more money to need do that. more money. Now you mentioned takedowns of violent gangs and you're noticing that it so often includes seizures of massive amounts of fentanyl. Am I correct in that? That's absolutely right. I think something like 75% uh, of the fentanyl we're seizing is coming in gang takedowns, something in that magnitude. Now tell me about these gangs. Are these American citizens? Most of the gangs uh, themselves are... Uh, are neighborhood gangs. I mean, there are you know gangs that come from the Northern Triangle, like MS-13 and so forth as well. But but a lot of the takedowns that I'm describing, uh, that we're dismantling, are frankly neighborhood gangs uh, who are then the ones peddling the fentanyl on the streets, not just in the border states, but all over the country. And 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 how are they getting the the, the how are they getting the fentanyl and the opioids from Mexico? I think that uh, much of that's probably a question better directed to uh, to DHS. I can tell you because most of our seizures right. 
are happening not at the ports of entry. They're happening after the stuff's already here somewhere inside the United States. We had a big takedown in New England, about as far away from the southern border as you could get. Something the biggest takedown, I think, in New England history involving all, you know, mountains of fentanyl. So that's really where we're seeing it. Uh, but the actual traffic across the border and the ports of entry is, uh, you know, is DHS's lane. I know they've got a heck of a challenge on their hands, to put it mildly. Thank you, Director. I yield back. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director, for being here. I wanted to ask about, uh, continue to ask about the border um, and your involvement at, at the border in assisting with identification of individuals. You'd agree that um, it's a national security risk to allow individuals into the country um, who are not properly identified, correct? That, that does raise national security concerns, yes. Okay. Uh, the FBI has been engaged in, in DNA testing for several years of individuals crossing the border. In fact, um, DHS recently or within the past few years mandated that that identification occur, correct? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, when DHS rolled out that program, uh, authorities found that about 19% of family units crossing were fraudulent. Uh, does that sound about right? That part I don't, I don't have any reason to dispute it, but I, as I sit here right now, I can't remember that specific piece. Okay. Yeah. But failure to properly identify individuals coming across the border uh, engaged in human trafficking, sex trafficking, child sex trafficking, are, are attempting to evade uh, identification, correct? Right. I mean, the whole identification piece of this is, I think you're rightly putting your finger on, is such an important part of it. And that's why, for example, uh, we have, as of trying to be good partners with DHS, we have been providing them with DNA kits that then uh, our lab uh, is the one who would then test, and it has proven to be critical in identifying murderers, rapists, and all sorts of you know dangerous individuals. But you have a shortfall, right? You have a backlog. And we have a backlog, and that backlog, because of the sheer volume at the border, with the with the volume of people coming across, the volume of the need for samples has gone skyrocketing as well. So there's a backlog, and the backlog should be of concern to to all of us. Do you think it would? Uh, be appropriate or would address this national security risk, as you say, uh, if we were to ensure, if we were to ensure that these individuals uh, would not be released until their identification is complete. Well, uh, certainly, I think that's something that we should be taking a look at. I mean, that gets into sort of DHS's authority, so I'm a little reluctant to, you know, given the sheer number of things that are on our, our plate uh, before I start weighing in on what should be on somebody else's plate. But I, I will tell you that um, we have any number of instances where somebody who is of concern, where there wasn't adequate uh, biometrics or other identification information at the time they came across, then later information is found that highlights why they're of concern. Uh, and then it's the FBI and our partners who have to then go try to find the person, take whatever action we can to disrupt the threat that that person poses. So, okay, rather than ask if it yeah. should be mandated, let me ask it this way. Would it improve security at our border to ensure that only those who have been properly identified are released into the country? Uh, at least as I sit here right now, I don't see how that couldn't help. Okay. Thank you. I want to also ask about, um, you, you touched on it in your testimony, FISA Section 702. Um, you've said that a warrant requirement would gut, I think was your term, uh, at compliance with the Fourth Amendment would gut a tool that you have. Is that essentially... Uh, well, uh, I did use the word gut, and I stand by it. I would say a couple things. First, when you say compliance with the Fourth Amendment, let's be clear. No court, as in none, 
has ever held that a warrant is required under the Fourth Amendment for the FBI to run queries of information that's already lawfully under in our holdings under Section 702. And the only courts to have addressed the issue but isn't have that gone infor- the other way. So that's one. But isn't that information uh, the intent of the law uh, designed to provide the information of foreign nationals, not American citizens, uh, who are and, – and wouldn't that really be a – an and run around the statute, as you say, to lawfully obtain uh, this information? No, no. I appreciate the question. Um, I think the purpose of Section 702 is to identify foreign threats to us, to Americans. Uh, And so when you have, I'll give you an example to illustrate the point, it is critical for our ability to identify foreign terrorist organizations communicating with, inspiring, or working with people here in the U.S., and that's how we identify and stop attacks. We had an example just last year where we had an individual foreign terrorist overseas who had had some kind of contact, not sure what it was at that point, with some person we believed to be in the United States. So we did a query. We ran a U.S. person query on that U.S. individual's identifiers. But at the time we ran that query, we didn't know what we had. Could it, was it the equivalent of a wrong number? Was it just innocuous chit-chat? Or was it something that was concerning? Well, because we were able to run the query, again, information already lawfully in our holdings, that's when we discovered, that's when we discovered, whoa, wait a minute, we got a live one here. This is serious. This is urgent investigation kicked in very quickly and within less than a month, within less than a month from that first query, we were able to uh, arrest the person who had by that time weapons, bomb making equipment, targets circled and everything else. And the point I would try to make here is that if we had had to get a warrant in a day to run that initial query, no, no sir, it doesn't work that way as somebody's had to get warrants. If we had had to get a warrant, for that initial query, there is no judge on the planet that would have given us a warrant based on what we knew at the time. All we knew at the time was foreign terrorist overseas, some kind of contact with some person in the U.S., no idea what it's about. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I've gone way over. I yield back. You mentioned earlier DNA testing. Uh, as I understand it, in 2020, the uh, Department of Homeland Security mandated uh, an expansion of DNA collections essentially everyone coming across the border. Is that correct? That's my understanding. And what's the purpose of of taking DNA samples of all migrants? Well, I think there are multiple purposes. I mean, I think one of them, uh, which goes to, the, I think, the question that Congressman Klein was act- asking about, is, you know, sometimes you have people who um, uh, we find a lot of times somebody then tries to re-enter <laughs> The country. They're deported, as they should have been, but then they try to re-enter, um, and because we have the D- and they may come across, you know, in some other way, and they turn up somewhere else because but we have the assume, DNA sample. Assumedly, yeah. uh, by doing DNA testing on all people entering the country at the border, uh, is to be able to find criminals among the lot. It, and it's, comparing the DNA test sample of that person against the national criminal records. Has that been effective? Have we caught criminals that way? Absolutely. Uh, It's two-pronged. And and the people who courts try to illegally reenter the country are also committing a crime. But but I think the point you're getting at is a very important one, which is that this authority and the funding that this subcommittee has has given us uh, over the years on this has enabled us to identify, you know, rapists, murderers, and any number of other dangerous criminals and crimes uh, around the country. And so the the DNA collection and the testing and the timely testing is critical to uh, solving sometimes very heinous crimes here in the United States. Well, in in, uh, the 24 budget, we included uh, $53 million that you had requested to address the increase in numbers of DNA samples. Um, and the border has become more open since that time with much more people, many much more people coming across than before. And yet you made no request for money in fiscal 25. 
What's going on? Well, partly what we've done is to try to uh, prioritize that collection effort with the funds that uh, the subcommittee has already given us. The key to our 2025 request is to try to restore the roughly 1,000 position cut that the net effect of uh, the 24 budget would have. That's what, uh, in our judgment, because we've had to make hard choices, very consistent with the spirit of, uh, of your opening uh, remarks, Mr. Chairman, and so that we didn't want to take away money from the DNA collection, and so we've, but, but in our budget request, we're trying to restore the positions that go to everything from ransomware to violent crime to fentanyl interdiction to uh, counter espionage against the Chinese, I could go on and on, but. Well, now there's a 15 month backlog on DNA testing. So by the time these people are tested and counted, they're gonna be long gone. Because you've got that backlog. You, you will get no argument from me, sir, that the backlog is a negative development and that if this subcommittee were to give us more resources for more DNA testing, we could bring down that backlog even further. Uh, you mentioned hard choices. Uh, we got good funding from the subcommittee before for this particular effort and we haven't taken money away from it, but we've had to prioritize the uh, significant uh, hit that we took uh, in terms of the impact on our, our personnel um, in the 24 budget, and that's what you see. But if you if you would see fit to give us more money for it, I can assure you it will help, uh, and the effort that the DNA collection is designed to accomplish is something that I think you and I both agree is extremely important. Well, you make the request. We'll take it up. Ms. Bang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director Ray. Uh, I, along with several of my colleagues in the House and Senate, have previously communicated with the DOJ and the FBI about the importance of the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Program's reports on hate crime statistics. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, the trend of a decrease in the number of local law enforcement agencies providing the FBI with incident data. This is the fifth year in a row that the number of local agencies providing data to the FBI has declined. Wanted to ask how your agency may be working with local law enforcement agencies to increase participation in this reporting system. So I think you're right to ask about the, the issue uh, because one of the things we know about hate crime reporting just in general as a starting point is that it's chronically underreported. Um, and so for quite some time now, we've been trying to engage in different forms of outreach to uh, our law enforcement partners to uh, make it easier for them to understand what to report and how to report it and so forth. Uh, and so that effort is continuing, and we're always trying to find new and better ways to improve their um, responsiveness, if you will. Uh, the second thing that I think contributes to the trend that you're describing is the conversion to uh, NIBRS, uh, the National Incident-Based Reporting System. And of course, that affects statistics um, not just on hate crimes, but on all sorts of other crime reporting uh, as well. And the NIBRS transition uh, is something that has been in the works for years and years and years. I mean, dating back to well before I became FBI director, uh, and we'd been repeatedly telling state local law enforcement that this is coming, this is coming. Uh, and, and once it gets to the point where we've shifted over to that, uh, you're that's the only way you're gonna be able to report. But there are a lot of departments uh, that haven't yet made the conversion to NIBRS reporting. Every year it's been going up. We're getting closer and closer where we need to be on that. And I should add that the NIBRS reporting system is something that all the major law enforcement associations wanted us to switch to. It's not something we just came up with on our own. Uh, but so in the meantime, we're trying to work with them to supplement that uh, reporting to make sure that you know any gaps in the um, completeness of the statistical picture are compensated for during this kind of transitionary period. So that, those are some of the things we're doing on that. 
Appreciate that. Um, and then, you know, in recent years, there was a rise in hate crimes committed against uh, people of Asian descent. In fiscal year 2021, I was proud to partner with the DOJ to bolster federal data collection in response to hate crimes. Um, I'm concerned about uh, language obstacles and what the FBI can maybe be doing more to reach those who may have limited English proficiency, um, <clears throat> and also to make sure that we are increasingly building trust with local uh, underrepresented communities. I, I don't want the DOJ and the FBI to lose the momentum of all the efforts that have been happening to reach communities like the Asian American community. So uh, we agree with you that uh, outreach to the community is an incredibly important part of the effort here. Uh, we've been doing, I think over the last few years, you know, hundreds of uh, training and liaison efforts uh, with the AA community specifically, both locally and, and some nationally. Uh, we have uh, some of the materials that we've produced that help people understand, you know, how to recognize hate crimes and, you know, what is it, what it is and what it isn't and, you know, how to report it and so forth. We've actually had translated into multiple languages, including all the major, um, uh, the most common AAPI languages, um, and we've tried to have our people out in the community. I think one additional piece to this that doesn't always get connected up with the so-called, uh, with sort of the hate crimes piece of it, is what we call transnational repression, which is uh, efforts by the Chinese government, specifically the Chinese Communist Party, to harass, stalk, blackmail, or worse, uh, you know, Chinese Americans and people of Chinese descent here. And so, uh, we've been trying to reach out to the same communities on that as well so that they understand that we're there for them um, and to try to help protect them against the, the common enemy, frankly, that we both have, or the common adversary, I should say, uh, namely the Chinese Communist Party. On that note, I'll end with, I, I just want to make sure that the law enforcement agencies are also utilizing uh, culturally competent uh, trainings and uh, with, with their agents. Thank you. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you, Director Ray. Uh, uh, I'll be honest with you, and, and this pains me to say this, but I don't trust you. Um, I, I don't think that this is necessarily a funding problem that we have for your for your agency as, as much as a leadership problem. And between the, the lack of transparency in hearings like this and in intel hearings, your, your weaponization and politicization of issues and instruments of national security against innocent Americans and against institutions like churches and the fact that you have held no one truly accountable for prior FISA abuses that we have all seen and recognized. I think you yourself have acknowledged that there's been abuses and because of the fact that as the FBI director that you've stood relatively silent and passive about the biggest national security threat to our nation, that being our very open southern border as the chairman has been uh, discussing. Uh, I, I give very little credence uh, in either your ability to do this job or, frankly, lead the brave agents below you, and I, I don't trust you to protect us, and that, that, that is a very difficult thing for me to say. It pains me to say that because your job is critically important to the safety of this nation and American lives, and I think because of your inability to lead and, and also shape the policies in the DOJ and at the White House, uh, we are now in a more precarious position than we were uh, I would submit uh, than we were in, on September 10th of 2001. You yourself say in your written testimony that over the past year, the threats facing our nation have escalated. The breadth of these threats and challenges are as complex as any time in our history, and the consequences of not responding and countering these threats have never been greater. These are your words. And we, we don't only pay you to warn us of a threat, which you have eloquently done here, although that's, that's important and appreciated that you're, you're warning us, but we also pay you to prevent and protect us from the threats. And you're um, on, in an agency, and I'm on committees where I'm, I'm your authorizer on the Intel Committee, and I'm your appropriator here on the CJS Subcommittee on Appropriations, and I, I find it difficult to trust you to protect us, and any data or budget requests you bring to us as a result of that is, in my opinion, suspect. And, in your nearly 20 pages of written testimony, you've mentioned the southern border only approximately four times, and even then you kind of gloss over it. And 
We now have 7 million people in our country, 350 people uh, on the FBI terror watch list uh, who have been apprehended, plus a, another 1.7 million known gotaways here within our borders as a result of your leadership's border policies. And I say your leadership and not your bosses because your, your bosses are the American people, right? Uh, your customers are the American people. You, you work for them. You work for the people to protect them. So, so your leadership, the President of the United States, uh, A.G. Garland and, and, and Director of Homeland Security Mayorkas are literally intentionally putting the people that you work for, the average American citizen, into a clear and present danger situation that you yourself have acknowledged in your in your written testimony. So you've, you've testified before the Intel Committee uh, with the worldwide threats uh, briefs and other committees that there are giant red warning lights and warning signs and uh, you know, lots of flashing signs from a threat and terrorism assessment perspective. You, you know, and, and it's evident that you know and agree with this notion and that we should all be concerned. Yet, despite this, you have been un unable to change the policies driven by your leadership, by the president, the AG, uh, DHS Mayorkas. And so it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's, it's in addition to being untrustworthy, you are, you are also ineffective at a very important part of your job, which is shaping the policies that do affect national security. And um, that should be, the open border should be the biggest challenge uh, that, that, that your, your administration is recognizing right now, and, and unfortunately is not. Uh, and, and I think your, your biggest problem personally is that it's not just me that doesn't trust you, it's the American people that don't trust you right now as a result of that. Can I j just get a simple yes or no response to this question? Does the open border policy make your job easier or harder? Are we safer or, or less safe um, as a result of the open border policy? I have been consistent uh, over the years, frankly, in citing my concerns about the threats that emanate from the border. Okay. Um, and as to the long narrative that you went through at the beginning, needless to say, uh, I disagree very strongly with any number of aspects of it, but I, I recognize I that we're time limited. Time, I, I, right. I want you to acknowledge that the open border policy makes us more uh, insecure than and strong. So I, 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 I want to know, what have your discussions been with the president? Have you been able to go into his office and say, boss, this, is, this open border policy is a galactically stupid policy from a national security perspective? Have you had that conversation? If so, what did that look like? What has been the response? And how are we shaping this to, to make us more secure in the future? Uh, well, I, I'm not going to get into specific conversations with people. I've been consistent in my message externally and internally about my concerns about the threats that are from the FBI's perspective that emanate from the border. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Mr. Morelli. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, always for your uh, leadership, and thanks to the ranking member. Um, uh, Director, uh, I want to say uh, that I do trust you, and I'm one, uh, very, very grateful for your service uh, on behalf of uh, this entire country and the people who put their faith in you and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I frankly find it somewhat astonishing at this date and uh, in, in, in the age in which we live that the American uh, leadership here at times questions the role of the FBI. I don't question it. I know you have a tough job, and I appreciate all the incredible work that you do. Um, if I may, I just wanted to, uh, despite decreasing, I think you mentioned in your testimony, decreasing rates of homicide, non-fatal shootings in my community of Rochester, New York, upstate New York, uh, we remain in a gun violence state of emergency. <clears throat> As you know, the passage of the 2022 uh, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act uh, implemented changes in the national instant criminal background check system, uh, NICS, including a comprehensive background check on gun buyers under the age of 21 years old. Um, in this fiscal year, uh, you're requesting $43 million to sustain implementation of that act, uh, as well as $8.4 million to support enhanced background checks, uh, which includes funding to address provisions such as the under-21 uh, background checks. And I'm just uh, would ask um, Considering the critical role NICS plays in preventing firearms from uh, reaching the wrong hands, can you just share with me how the budget request will allow the FBI to address these, what I expect are, and, and uh, assume are pretty labor-intensive enhancements to the operation of NICS as uh, transactions continue to grow? 
So I appreciate the question. Uh, the uh, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act added uh, a number of additional checks uh, that Nix uh, was responsible for conducting, uh, specifically focused on, as we would call it, the U21 uh, group um, uh, population. And um, this committee, uh, and we're very grateful uh, for that, helped get us at the time of the passage of the act funding to, to bring on board positions uh, and make certain systems changes. But the, the problem is it was one-time funding. Uh, and so that it, if we're going to sustain the work, then we need funding to continue it. And that's what you see reflected uh, in the request here. It's both uh, to, to continue those positions, because it's, as you say, very labor intensive, uh, but also for systems enhancements to have the, the human workforce uh, have them be even more efficient in their work. I've been out there myself uh, and sat with the operators who were doing the checks uh, on a couple of occasions uh, to see, and so I can see kind of how labor intensive it is. Mm -hmm. I'm very pleased with the fact that they're already getting much, much faster at them. Um, and I think that's only going to improve, but we still do need the, the funding. Again, the way to remember it is just it was Funding was there, but it was one-time funding, and we just need the funding to, to sustain it. Otherwise, it's, it sort of loses its uh, effectiveness. And that's going to be, obviously, an annual request, then, to be able to continue to maintain this, and I suspect yes, even sir. require additional dollars in future years to be able to deal with the, um, the growing uh, number of, uh, of challenges that we have there. Um, if I can, um, coordination and partnership between the FBI and state, local, uh, and tribal entities is uh, integral to the security of communities across the nation. In my community, the FBI leads the Rochester Area Major uh, Crimes Task Force, the Child Exploitation Task Force, and the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and participates in the Rochester Safe Streets Task Force. Um, considering your successful nationwide efforts alongside state and local law enforcement partners to combat violent crime, could you describe how the proposed budget will further enhance and strengthen information sharing and coordination among uh, not only the FBI, but all the your, your local partners? So uh, the biggest part of our budget request in 25 is to uh, restore the and essentially the, the cuts that we endured in the 24 budget, um, which uh, there's no way to sustain without having an impact on our efforts on violent crime, on child exploitation, uh, on a whole range of threats that were um, responsible for protecting the American people from. Um, and so the, the request will allow us to continue the good work that's being done uh, in upstate New York and elsewhere on uh, gang violence, on child exploitation, on cyber attacks, um, on the cartels and organized crime, which, as I said before, that's not just a border problem. It affects all 50 states, and we're seizing huge amounts of fentanyl all over the country. So. Uh, all these things are incredibly important. Our folks are doing great work. Uh, on the violent crime side, for example, just last year, uh, we were arresting through our task forces uh, 50 violent criminals and child predators per day, every day, all year long. So a cut means more bad guys on the street, more gangs terrorizing neighborhoods, more kids at risk, uh, et cetera. Uh, I see my time has expired. Mr. Chair, you're always uh, very gracious. I appreciate it. Uh, Director, thank you for your continued service, sir. I yield back. Mr. Clyde. Thank you, Chairman Rogers. Um, Director Ray, as I'm sure you know, this week the House has been considering the reauthorization of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, commonly known as FISA. I've been deeply troubled with the abuse of Section 702 of FISA in recent years, and so your testimony today is very well timed. Thank you. Um, so, Director Ray, does the FBI currently comply in every way with the current Section 702 of FISA? My understanding is that we're in compliance with the law. Okay, so you think you do. All right, how do you respond to an unsealed document released by the U.S. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court on May 19th, 2023, which states your agency, the FBI, illegally misused this tool uh, more than 278,000 times between 2020 and early 2021 and 
Is this number of 278,000 abuses accurate? So I appreciate the question. I'm glad to have the opportunity to clar clarify that. So first off, I would say that that opinion covers activity, querying activity, that occurs all before all these reforms that we've put in place. So that's number one. Second, the, when did you start that, putting those reforms in place? Uh, mid-2022, right mid somewhere in that range. Um, uh, 2022 or 2023? They started in 2022, and they kind of rolled into 23. They obviously okay. don't just flick right. a switch. But, right. but the second thing I would say, too, is when you look at the FISA court, the same judges uh, evaluating our compliance with 702 after all those reforms have put in place, you see consistently compliance rates well into the high 90 percent range. Uh, and the court actually commending the FBI for the uh, improvements that they've seen because of the reform. So that's the second point. Okay. The third so point I would make to you, third point, this is important because you, you asked, a third point that's important is that the querying that you're talking about in that uh, okay. opinion that, again, covers older activity, uh, the, something like 99.7% of it would all have been prevented by the reforms that we've put in place. Okay. On top of that, on top of that, the vast majority of those queries, the 278,000, are not actually 702 queries, much less non-compliant 702 queries. Well, let me ask you this. This report ended in early 2021, and you started in mid-2022, so that would be an entire year. So during that time frame, uh, how many times did the FBI abuse its FISA authority? Do you know? I don't, I don't have any period of noncompliance uh, that I can report here from that period, but I can okay. tell you, but I can uh, tell you this. Well, the court, uh, right, that, that, the, the th court's thank you for answering that, that covers question. the more recent period. As you know, the government time. agencies typically need a warrant issued by a judge before they can access American citizens' phone calls, texts, internet searches, and emails. However, the government, in my opinion, has been able to query Section 702 acquired communications as an end run around the Fourth Amendment. My colleague, Andy Biggs, rep, um, representative from Arizona, has an amendment to the current FISA reauthorization that would require the government to obtain a warrant or to obtain a FISA court order prior to conducting a U.S. citizen query of information already collected through the 702 FISA program. You know, you previously stated in a Senate hearing in December that it would be unworkable to require the government to get a warrant before collecting Americans' private communications. Yet former NSA lawyer George Croner recently estimated the warrant requirement would force the FBI to get about three warrants a day. Now, Director Ray, you've got more than 30,000 employees that work for the FBI. Are you seriously saying that three warrants a day is too much of a burden for the FBI to protect our Fourth Amendment rights? That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, number one, no court has found that the Fourth Amendment requires us to use a warrant to look at information, to query information that's already in our 702 holdings lawfully, and the only courts to look at it have gone the other way. That's no one. Number two, the problem with the warrant requirement goes beyond any kind of burden or delay that comes with it. The big part of the problem is that it's often only by running the query that we get to see the information that tells us whether or not we would meet a warrant requirement in the first place. Because All right, I've got one more question for you before my time runs out. Investigation. All right. Um, we have, uh, looking at the breakdown of the FBI's $11.3 billion budget, uh, like last year, almost 60% of the budget is categorized as defense spending and only 40% as non-defense spending. And to me, that seems odd. I read your mission priorities, and I did not see any reference to DOD. I mean, the FBI is not part of the Department of Defense, and they're a domestic law enforcement agency. So why is the FBI's budget categorized as 60% defense spending? I believe the answer to your question, and I'm not an appropriations expert, but I believe the answer to your question is in what's so-called NIP funding, uh, which is, is, is overseen by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. So a significant chunk of our budget uh, is considered defense spending because of its uh, part of the intelligence community budget, if you will. Right. So this, it gets a little more complicated than that, but I think that's the, the, the high-level answer to your question. Okay. All right. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Rappersberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First thing I want to say, uh, I think that your questions are important, and I think a lot of people <clears throat> who haven't been involved in law enforcement are not sure what 702 is and all of those issues. 
I was a former prosecutor, investigative prosecutor, ran a strike force, so I know that. And I've been working you know, in, in, in the Intel Committee and Defense my whole career here. It's been over 20 years. Now, um, and I think you answered the questions, and I think those questions are, 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 are right, that you've, we've, cleaned up seven, we've cleaned up 702, uh, and it's really happening. I'm not happy with the comments, and he's not here anymore, and I'll talk to him personally, uh, to, to just to criticize you. I've worked with different FBI <coughs> agents, and you're as good as any of them. You're good, you're quality, and you're respected by your peers, and that's what's important. But we're in a serious situation in this country right now, and, and with, with respect to what's happening you know, with China and what's happening with Russia and, <coughs> and all of these issues. And, and I, I'm really, really worried about where we're going to go, and I think we're at the worst spot. The Republicans and Democrats are fighting each other all the time. Um, you know, on, and this issue is both sides of the aisle as far as, as what's going on in the country. What I would like, to, like you to do um, uh, is um, talk about what uh, FISA 702, why it's so important, and why it's one of the most dangerous issues we're dealing with. And, we're, and, and I think the FBI is being caught up right now. And, and, and really, President Trump, people who are supporting him, the heck can support him, that's fine. And I don't, I don't want to interfere to that. That's whatever you want to do. But don't mess with the United States of America and our national security, because that's what you're doing. This is as serious as anything. I do a lot with the, with the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. I work with, with them also in, that, in this regard. This issue is one of the most important issues. So could you please say why it's so important that we pass this and not get caught up in a Trump issue because he's mad. He authorized this law when he was president. So come on, not, not, let's not play the hypocrisy. Could you please tell you know, the public at this point, or us, where we are and why it's so important? So Section 702 is indispensable in keeping Americans safe from a whole barrage of fast-moving foreign threats. It is crucial to identifying terrorists in the homeland, working with or inspired by a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations who have publicly called for attacks against our country. It helps us find out who these terrorists are working with and what they're targeting, and we made, and it's what we need to stop them before they kill Americans. 702 is crucial when countries like China or Iran target dissidents uh, and Americans here in the homeland. In Iran's case, literally, even for things like kidnapping and assassination, 702 is what uh, helps us know who to warn and help disrupt the plot. 702 is crucial to our ability to warn and protect our critical infrastructure from hackers in the China, in Russia, Iran, uh, including cyber threats to our electricity, our water, our hospitals. Uh, so if Congress lets 702 lapse, which it's set to do now next week, it will massively increase the risk of missing crucial intelligence during a time of heightened national security threats across a, a whole multiple of fronts. And if we're blinded from seeing what our adversaries uh, are doing, who they're working with, I can tell you that's going to most definitely have consequences for our ability to protect the American people. Because I can assure you that none of our adversaries are tying their own hands. So now is not the time for us to hang up our gloves uh, to take away tools that we need to punch back and failing to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put American lives at risk. And this is the director of the FBI. I, I don't know anyone who knows this law that doesn't feel strongly about this issue with respect to 702. I would add to that that there's a pattern uh, across multiple administrations, Republicans and Democrats alike. If you look at the professionals who have actually worked with this authority and dealt with these threats from the working level to the presidentially appointed level, again, across administrations, including a whole range of my colleagues from the last administration, because after all, I was nominated by President Trump and have is, uh, overwhelmingly confirmed without a single Republican senator ever voting against me, whether nominated by President Bush or President Trump. Every single one of them uh, supports the importance of 702, and that, I think that should tell people something. Well, I thank you for, for our country and what you're doing. Uh, I yield back. 
Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Director, for your service to this great nation. I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force that recently was able to apprehend an individual in Idaho that had ISIS-related ties. It's exactly the type of things we need to do to keep Americans safe, and so thank you for, for your men and women for that. My first question is, if FISA were to expire, would our southern border be more or less secure? I think if, if FISA were to expire, it, it adds one more challenge to our ability to secure us from foreign threats, including border-related threats. I'll tell you, in my district, a lot of people talk about the border. I live the border. We, we, are, we are on the border every single day. So people throw, throw rocks from afar. We're the ones that have to live it. My next question is, have there been any cases where the DOJ prosecu prosecutors chose not to prosecute a case that your agency, that your bureau identified as a significant threat to the homeland or community interests? I, I can't think of a specific case as I'm sitting here right now. Uh, I will certainly tell you that um, disagreements between agents and prosecutors at the working level is something that, that happens. It's a healthy discussion that happens all the time when we think we have enough and the prosecutor doesn't think we have enough. I've seen that from both sides, having been a prosecutor too. Uh, but I don't have any specific case that, that I can think of that fits. The this truth. is what I worry about, is we have a case teed up that has identified a, a, a security threat to either community or the homeland, and it doesn't go prosecuted, and something bad happens. And we look back and we see this, you know something's going to happen. It's only a matter of when, and I don't want us to be going playing armchair quarterback. How do we get ahead of some of these issues? And I think there needs to be a closer relationship with the prosecutors and the agents on the ground. One, one thing in that regard that we do, uh, and I've seen a big change in the FBI oh, since, again, I was somebody who was in FBI headquarters on 9-11, so I'm, I'm well familiar with a lot of this stuff. What I would say to you is today's FBI also works very closely with state and local prosecutors too. So sure. if there's ever an instance where uh, a charge in the, in the state system is a better way to quickly disrupt sure. uh, an attacker, we, we're not shy about working with local prosecutors, not just federal prosecutors. My next question, what is the FBI doing to combat the rise in transnational criminal organizations, specifically the Venezuelan gang, Tran de Agua, TDA? So, uh, uh, we're certainly tracking that particular gang, TDA, as we would refer to it. Um, uh, we have Safe Streets Violent Gang Task Forces uh, in all 56 of our field offices, uh, which are focused specifically on gangs and other similar violent criminal enterprises. Uh, and that's the vehicle through which we are looking at TDA, whether it's leaders, members, associates. Uh, we have ongoing engagement with intelligence community partners, state and local law enforcement, uh, in some cases foreign partners, uh, in looking at whether it's their you know, drug trafficking, extortion, kidnapping for ransom, um, you know, different kinds of violent crime, different kinds of trafficking and smuggling, uh, even things like organized retail theft. Uh, so it's a it's a you know real menu of of different criminal. I, I'd ask that you take a hard look at this because no one's talked. Very few people are talking about TDA right now. In three years, we're going to be talking about TDA no different than we're talking about MS-13. And it's going to be the communities that get ahead of it, that create these task forces, that utilize these task forces at the local, state, and federal level to combat these Venezuelan gangs. Once again, I live the border. You're, the, we're year four of this. Year four is much different than year one. The people that are coming over are different people. They're different actors. To that point, I was just out in West Texas. I did a swing through West Texas. I'm seeing a significant increase in oil theft in West Texas, all my sheriffs are asking for help. Are there any opportunities to expand the FBI uh, oil field theft task force? So uh, absolutely, we, uh, we're very proud of the work that our uh, West Texas uh, offices are doing in terms of the Permian Basin oil field uh, task force. It's uh, created due to the fact that I think something like 40% of the oil in the US comes from the West Texas region. Uh, and so that task force, uh, you know, has not only uh, state and local law enforcement participation, but we also have, which is a bit innovative, um, cleared oil field, oil field security personnel, uh, you know, the, typically they're former law enforcement as well, but also on the, on the task force. Uh, and it's a way to kind of track 
oil field crime, uh, to uh, ensure that investigations move as quickly as and effectively as possible. Um, it is a complex, in a form, a critical. It's a form of critical infrastructure threat, and it's something we're we're very focused on. Director, this is a this is a threat that I'm seeing is is correlated directly to the open border. I'm seeing a, a more and more uh, foreign nationals, in particular Cuban Cubans, that are here illegally that are operating in this space. And so we need to, once again, as this border crisis expands, we need to get ahead of this. And I'd, I'd ask that you consider taking a hard look at that oil field task force. Uh, with that, Chairman, I'm out of time and I yield back. Uh, I want to now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Laurel. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, ranking member Cartwright, my apologies for dashing in and, and eventually dashing out. There are several hearings, so trying to make as many as, as as I can, and Director, so pleased uh, uh, that the President's budget for 2025 increases funding to uh, uh, hire additional FBI personnel, uh, helping to bolster your capacity to deter cybercrime, combat foreign intelligence activity against the U.S., improve the national instant criminal background check system. And I know my colleague, Mr. Morelli, um, discussed that issue. Um, first of all, I should say thank you to you for making a visit to New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, just, you know, just a few weeks ago, uh, and, and, and really delighted to have you there was the opportunity to um, uh, be in a field office, if you will, um, and to talk about the FBI's work in my state. And to piggyback off my colleague's comment, what I wanted to do was to address uh, the, uh, the, the, the work with task forces. I, I, I view... Um, <clears throat> What you are doing with regard to state and local government is uh, overall infrastructure. Like we have a public health infrastructure, we rely on on uh, state laboratories, etc. Um, and when you look at defunding those efforts, you look like at the collapse of the ability to move forward with regard that the CDC has the inability to move forward. But I think sometimes, I think some of my colleagues are unaware of just how frequently the FBI works in very close partnership with state and local law enforcement uh, to be able to deal with, 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 with crime. If you could talk about what are the lessons learned by both the FBI and state and local law enforcement about ways in which the task forces that were mentioned maximize that effectiveness in fighting a, a, a crime. And if the, I don't know if there are any stories that are especially worth highlighting, but I would finally add, what happens, because there are many, as you know, would look to defund the FBI, and a lot of discussion about that, cut back on the resources. What does that mean to the support of that national infrastructure, if you will, uh, that you rely on and they rely on you in order to deal with violent crime uh, and others, uh, other things in the, in the U.S., if you could comment on that. Sure. I think uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't fully appreciate is how integrated today's FBI is with state and local law enforcement and how dependent, frankly, state and local law enforcement is on us when it comes to fulfilling our shared mission of keeping Americans safe. You mentioned the task forces. Through our Safe Streets and Violent Crime Task Forces, we've got thousands of police officers and sheriff's deputies who, from hundreds uh, of different departments and agencies that serve on our task forces, uh, taking, you know, as I said, I think earlier, last year we took together uh, 50 violent criminals and child predators off the streets per day, every single day, all year long, 365 days a year when you average it out. Uh, a cut to our budget means a cut to our efforts to do that work, which means more of the burden then gets shifted on the state and local law enforcement to handle those threats alone. Uh, I could go the same, on, same thing through multiple other threats because we have task forces on terrorism, cyber, child exploitation, et cetera. But it's not just arrests. I think if you talk to chiefs and sheriffs like I do every week, uh, you will hear constantly a refrain about how much they depend on the FBI for things like our technology and our expertise. So it's the DNA testing, it's cellular analysis, it's all sorts of complex forensic expertise that small departments in this country don't, don't have, but they lean on us to provide that, and that's one of the first things that they cite. 
you talk about our, our CGIS division in West Virginia, which is the one that is responsible for NCIC background checks when some officer is stopping somebody on the streets. That's how they know whether the person's dangerous or not, or fingerprint identification, or the threat reporting that comes into our National Threat Operating Center, which are often threats to life, school shootings, whatever else it happens to be, that we're then pushing out to state and local law enforcement. Uh, cuts to those programs means those all those ways state and local law enforcement flying blind. And then you got things like training, right? A lot of people don't this. The FBI is, for example, responsible for training all the civilian bomb techs. So the bomb techs for every police department in the country that have bomb techs are trained by the FBI in our uh, facility in Huntsville. Uh, and cuts to our ability to provide that training means uh, impacts on our ability to train uh, you know, bomb tech uh, personnel. But it's all sorts of other training. We provide all sorts of training to state and local uh, law enforcement at Quantico. Uh, and I, as I said, I'm talking with chiefs and sheriffs in one way or another pretty much every week. Uh, and there's only two ways the conversation goes. Thank you, director, for all the great things the FBI is doing for us. We need even more. Mm -hmm. And just, director, we need even more. I have yet to meet a chief or sheriff who wants the FBI to, giving, to give them less. And so I think people need to understand that cuts to our budget don't just hurt the FBI. They hurt all those state and local law enforcement partners, many of whom, unlike the FBI, have recruiting challenges and retention challenges. They're all down in terms of their headcount. They've got their own budget challenges. So hurting us compounds their challenges and makes it harder for them to protect the neighborhoods and communities that we're all working together to try to protect. Mm -hmm. I'll just make a final comment to you. I think it would be critically important for what you've just said and for members to understand and maybe talk with, hear from their local law enforcement folks and understand what the connection is between state and local law enforcement and the FBI. I think we'd see a lot less movement in the direction of saying, uh, let's defund, let's eliminate, let's do all of these things when we look at the overall law enforcement infrastructure in the United States, which is part of our uh, national security and defending the homeland and doing whatever we want in that direction. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your service. Really appreciate it. Mr. Ryder Holt. Yep. Thank you, uh, Director Ray. Um, a lot of, it doesn't always get a lot of media coverage, but uh, there's been a lot of hostility against churches and religious organization at alarming rates over the last few years. Uh, there was a report that was published uh, back in uh, February of this year that uh, showed that more than there's been 430 incidences of hostility or violence against churches uh, across the United States. Uh, that's a 100% increase from 2022, an 800% increase from uh, 2018. Uh, I guess my question to you is, is what uh, is the Bureau uh, resources are being dedicated um, to explore and address this concerning trend that we're seeing? So it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I would say uh, the threats to houses of worship that we're seeing cut across a variety of settings. And I say that with the perspective of somebody who, when I was a, a line prosecutor, one of my most significant cases was against a guy who was a serial church arsonist and went all over the country burning down churches, including uh, right up uh, in our mutual uh, neck of the woods in Georgia, where uh, he killed in Banks County, he killed a, uh, you know, a firefighter and almost killed another one. Um, and uh, so I've always taken those cases particularly uh, seriously. Um, I would say there's a couple things. We're seeing terrorist attacks uh, against churches. We've, in the, just in the time that I've been FBI director, we've thwarted multiple uh, attacks uh, uh, against churches uh, and synagogues. Uh, I can think of a, an ISIS-inspired uh, plot against a church in Pittsburgh. Uh, I can think of synagogues in Colorado in, uh, and Las Vegas area just as a few examples. Uh, there's also, uh, I would say, a range of threats um, from a perspective of uh, abortion-related 
um, violence. So, you know, a lot of people historically have focused on uh, abortion-related violence uh, when it comes to pro-choice facilities. But in fact, if you look at our work uh, post the Dobbs opinion, uh, it's been a while since I looked at our numbers, but uh, I think something like 70% of our abortion-related violence cases were, uh, after the Dobbs decision, were against uh, what I would have called houses of worship or, or pro-life facilities. In fact, uh, just yesterday we had a, a case, um, a guy got seven and a half years in a, a great case that our folks did against a guy who firebombed a facility uh, up in, uh, in the Madison, Wisconsin area. Um, so we're, we're tackling it depending on what the motivation for the threat is. You know, sometimes it might be some ISIS-inspired type attack. In some cases it might be some domestic ideology. Uh, in some cases, it might be something else altogether. Uh, so in addition to our investigative work and working with state and local law enforcement on that, um, we are also, in every field office, I find that there's a, a whole lot of outreach and engagement with uh, houses of worship in that area uh, so that the folks in those uh, houses of worship know who to contact uh, what to be on the lookout for, that kind of thing. Um, and I, well, I, I just, you yeah. know, let me just say, uh, you know, thank you for the mention that, but, you know, targeting and threatening of churches and religious organizations is something that cannot go unnoticed, and I would just employ uh, uh, that you would uh, make sure that uh, you do investigate and you try to make sure that this is a focus of your, uh, of the Bureau. Uh, the... Um, the, na the uh, names Phoenix, Holly, Harriet, Christopher X, Ahill, they're names that were given to the DC-5. Um, those were the five unborn children that remain, uh, whose remains were salvaged by a whistleblower after their lives were brutally ended by late-term abortionists uh, here in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, there's evidence that suggests federal crimes may have been committed. Um, and their deaths uh, through violations of the partial birth abortion ban and the born alive infant protections. As you know, the law, this is the law of the land and the administration has the duty to enforce the law without prejudice to political, political philosophy or those in violation of law. Instead of seeking justice for these babies or answering or answers to whether federal crimes are committed, um, I'm concerned that uh, some of the administration have decided to weaponize the FBI and its resources against pro-life Americans by investigating and arresting individuals for the FACE Act violations. Is the Bureau aware of the DC-5 case? And if, if so, is the Bureau investigating the DC-5 case? Uh, as I sit here right now, I'm not familiar with the specific case. I can I can follow up uh, with our folks uh, on that. I will tell you when it comes to um, FACE Act um, enforcement more generally, uh, we've used that authority um, in kind of in both directions. In fact, uh, I know that we had a case uh, not that long ago where we secured uh, FACE Act and conspiracy indictments against four individuals who were invoking the Jane's Revenge movement um, and who targeted pro-life facilities uh, in their area. So uh, we uh, don't care which side of the abortion issue you're on. There's a right way and a wrong way to express your uh, passionate views, but violence uh, and threats against facilities is, is not it. And then we'll go after it no matter which side. Somebody yeah, well, on. I'd like to get your commitment to use funds to investigate this DC-5 case. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, to find yeah. out where we are with that. Like I said, I'm not familiar with the specific case, uh, but we obviously want to make sure that if there's any uh, properly predicated investigation we can conduct, that if, we do. Yeah, if you could get back with us and let us know what y'all are doing on that. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Let me uh, do a little polling here. Do we need a second round of questions? I don't if you don't. Anyone here? I want to keep it as short as we can because this, I want this gentleman back at work. <laughs> so, Mr. Clad, you're on. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Ray, on page 16 of um, your budget request, you talk about civil rights. So the FBI has the primary responsibility to investigate all alleged violations of federal civil rights laws. 
And then you talk about color of law violations in there, uh, which is any person using the authority given to them by a government agency to willfully deprive someone of a right. Uh, so you talk about the FACE Act and voter suppression, et cetera. Um, have you ever investigated a Second Amendment rights violation? I mean, you've got the Bruin decision, which struck down a New York law, which took away people's Second Amendment rights. Um, and I've never seen anyone in government uh, ever prosecuted for violating citizens' Second Amendment rights. Can you think of any time when the FBI has actually, you know, used color of law to, to prosecute someone for violating their, someone's Second Amendment rights? Well, not, not as I sit here, but obviously we're a, a you know, 115-year-old organization with 38,000 employees and something like 300 offices all over the United States. So I, uh, I'm no doubt that there could be any number of investigations that I wouldn't be aware of. Okay. All right. Um, then um, you have a request in your budget for $284,000 um, for official reception fund. That is almost six times what the United States attorney himself receives. I mean, uh, his is $50,000, the ATF is 36,000, the DEA is 90,000, US attorneys are 19,600, but the FBI is $284,000. Why? Why is the FBI is literally six times what, you know, Attorney General Merrick Garland's uh, reception funds are? I don't know that I could tell, tell you as I sit here right now, I know that we have a lot of engagement with foreign partners, um, and that could be a big driver, but I can't, as I sit here right now, get, uh, give you the specifics, but I'm happy to have my staff follow back up with you. I would appreciate that very much. And then lastly, uh, the Department of Justice is asking for a 1.25% increase, totaling $467 million, all right? But the FBI is asking for a 6% increase, totaling $629 million. So the FBI is asking for literally a 350% increase in funding, more than the overall Department of Justice is. In fact, if the total spending for the DOJ is going up 467 million, and the FBI is asking for 629 million, then the DOJ actually has to take a cut somewhere in order for the FBI to get their increase in funding of at least $162 million. Um, so what on earth, what justifies that kind of an increase for the FBI? So what I would tell you is, and we certainly appreciate the department's support, uh, including the attorney general's support for our budget request. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the effect of the fiscal year 2024 budget uh, that was appropriated to us is the equivalent of about a thousand per position cut. It's about a $500 million cut in our ability to get our job done. And so when you look across the range of threats that we are responsible for protecting Americans from uh, violent crime, 50 bad guys per day, every day, uh, ransomware, 100 different ransomware variants that we're investigating, the Chinese, 1,300% uh, increase in Chinese economic espionage, the Chinese hacking program, which outnumbers us by well over 50 to 1, fentanyl, we seized 270 million uh, person's worth of, fa of fatal fentanyl in the last two years. And so the range of threats that the FBI is statutorily responsible for protecting Americans from is significant. Uh, and the impact of the 24 budget is such that most of what our budget request that you've talked about there uh, calls for is to put us back on track so we can keep doing the hard work of keeping uh, bad guys away from those people. Okay, so what are the technical adjustments? $192 million for technical adjustments and $286 million in adjustments to base. What is that? Uh, I think the adjustments to base is, is sort of appropriation speak for uh, the point that I was just making about getting us back on track in terms of the uh, positions that are essentially we would lose because of the impact uh, on our cost of operations uh, of the 24 budget. And the technical adjustments? Uh, that part, I, again, I'd have to go back and look at the okay. specifics, but I, I can tell you that most of our budget is to get us back on track. We have a few enhancements, specifically on cyber, counterintelligence, and NICS, um, but that's essentially the, this year, that's essentially our budget. All right, thank you, my time's expired. I yield back, Mr. Chair. I'll yield myself for five minutes. Um, 
Mr. Director, let me ask you about these global terrorist networks that you've mentioned. You recently testified that the threats, quote, have gone to a whole other level, quote, and that foreign terrorists, including ISIS and Al-Qaeda, have renewed calls for attacks here in the U.S. Could you expand on that? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, first off, I would say even before October 7th, uh, I would have told you and I was telling uh, other committees that we were at a heightened threat level because across a range of different terrorist vectors, we were, at, uh, at, like I said, at a, a heightened threat level. After October 7th, though, is when we went to a whole nother level. And part of that is that we've seen a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations calling for attacks on us. Uh, you've got Hezbollah expressing support and praise for Hamas and threatening to attack U.S. interests in the region. You've got Al-Qaeda issuing its most specific call for, for an attack against us, against the U.S. in the last five years. You've got uh, AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, calling for jihadists to attack Americans and Jewish communities in the U.S. You've got ISIS urging its followers repeatedly to attack Jewish communities in the U.S. And the, the irony is that, as anybody who has studied terrorism knows, these are terrorist organizations that don't typically see eye to eye, but they seem to be united in one thing, which is calling for attacks on us. And so you add on top of that uh, my concern, which I have repeatedly flagged, which is that when you look around the world at foreign terrorist organizations, uh, you can see in Afghanistan the concern about uh, whether it's al-Qaeda or ISIS-K growing strength and reconstituting. Uh, and, of course, we've lost some of our ability to, to gather intelligence on the threat there. You can look at Africa uh, and look at ISIS and al-Shabaab uh, and the growth of those organizations there. In fact, al-Shabaab is now the best-funded branch of al-Qaeda. You could look at Syria and ISIS's uh, repeated efforts to free some very dangerous fighters that are in the prisons there. And so then you look at things like the attack that we just had in Moscow, an attack in Iran before that, uh, ISIS attacks. Uh, and so when organizations like al-Qaeda, like ISIS, express an intent to conduct attacks against us, it's something we need to take very seriously. Uh, and so that's part of why I've highlighted this as a heightened threat. This is not a time for panic. It is a time for heightened vigilance. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, Director Ray, uh, the topic of anti-FBI rhetoric raised its head today, and uh, I, w I wish to associate myself with the comments of Mr. Ruppersberger. Uh, that I, I, I am dismayed about it, and particularly that it found its way into today's hearing. And, and uh, um, I regret that it has become fashionable in some corners to attack the FBI. This is, a, this is a, an elite law enforcement agency. The, the top law enfor enforcement agency in this country protects us from all manner of mayhem, from child predators, cyber threats, drug trafficking, gang violence, international terrorism, Hezbollah, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Al-Shabaab. Uh, these are men and women that have dedicated their lives to the protection of American citizens. They don't deserve to have threats leveled against them with anti-FBI rhetoric ginning them up. Last week, a man crashed an SUV into the security gate at the FBI's Atlanta Field Division building. He, he then resisted efforts by FBI agents to bring him into custody. Although this investigation is still under, underway, I am concerned about threats to FBI agents and FBI facilities in the field, particularly in light of anti-FBI rhetoric from far too many public officials. And I'd like you to comment on that to what extent are you seeing an uptick in threats against the FBI? And what does that do to morale within the agency? 
Well, you, you asked a, a couple of different questions there. I guess the, let me start with the, the threats, because that's ultimately what matters the most. Um, you know, rhetoric is rhetoric, and there's a lot of heated rhetoric in this country across a range of issues. But uh, when it comes to threats and threats of violence, uh, that's something we take extremely seriously. And we have seen a substantial jump in threats uh, towards FBI personnel and facilities from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23. In fact, we created a dedicated unit to try to deal with those issues. Uh, you uh, mentioned the Atlanta field office one. I won't discuss that specific case, but just last year in our Cincinnati field office, we had an individual wearing a tactical vest armed with a, an AR style rifle and a nail gun uh, tried to forcibly enter uh, and attack our personnel. And um, after uh, he was uh, thwarted uh, in reviewing his devices and his postings. He was calling on people to kill federal law enforcement and to fight, in his own words, a, a civil war. Uh, and unfortunately, this is part of a broader phenomenon that we see in the country right now, which is uh, an uptick in violence against law enforcement, not just FBI, but state and local law enforcement. Uh, and we've had uh, breathtaking paces of violence against law enforcement Having a badge is dangerous enough as it is. It shouldn't make somebody a target. And some of these threats target law enforcement's family members, which is despicable. Um, uh, like I said, these are dangerous jobs, uh, and I talk every week. One of the things I, uh, to state and local law enforcement are going through a lot of the same thing uh, in their own way. Um, I call every, one of the things I started doing when I started this job was uh, every time an officer or a sheriff's deputy is killed anywhere in the country uh, in the line of duty, I call the chief or the sheriff myself uh, to express my condolences on behalf of the FBI. And we talk about the individual's family and career and everything else. Um, and I have made 381 of those calls since I started as FBI director, 14 just so far this year. Um, we've lost, in 2021, we lost three of our own. Uh, two agents killed in Miami and a task force officer ambushed right outside of, right outside of uh, our office in Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, so violence against law enforcement is real, it's appalling, and it's something we take very seriously. Now, when you talk about morale, which is the other part of your question, Obviously, no one likes to see the organization you've dedicated your lives to uh, unfairly attacked and criticized. Uh, but our people are more focused on the people we do the work with, the people we do the work for, and the work itself. Um, and I don't get too hung up, and I think our folks don't get too hung up on rhetoric. Uh, our, our focus is on do people want to work with us? You bet they do. Uh, they're applying in droves. It's gone up. Recruiting's gone up significantly since I've been director. Do they want to work with us on task forces? State and local police departments, who are all down in terms of their headcount, are sending more and more task force officers to work on our task forces. And it sure as heck isn't because they don't have enough work in their home department. Do people want to turn to us for help? You bet they do. I, I see business leaders more and more turning to us with cyber attacks and Chinese economic espionage. I see the public calling our public access line uh, in West Virginia more and more turning to us for all manner of, of tips and threats. It's almost like we sort of defaulted into becoming like a national 911 center. So do people want to work for us? More and more. Do people want to work with us? More and more. Do people want to turn to us for help? more and more. And so that ultimately is what our folks really care about. Would we prefer not to be criticized? Of course. Director Ray, thank you for your comments and thank you for your work. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. So when yields back, Mr. Klein, do you desire time? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Chairman's recognized. And I want to um, thank the uh, large number of law-abiding agents within your agency who work hard for the American people every day. But we can't ignore uh, the violations that have occurred within the FBI by some individuals and the policy changes that were necessitated by those abuses. And for some on the other side to talk about anti-law enforcement rhetoric, when morale is at an all-time low in local law enforcement offices because of the defund the police 
movement on the left, it is rich. It is rich to hear this come from the other side. So my colleague uh, who spoke critically about the performance of some in your agency, Mr. Ray, uh, was doing so uh, with a, a, a love for country, a love for the Constitution, uh, and a desire to see um, the confidence of the American people in their institutions restored um, after it has been so eroded by the performance of some within your agency acting in violation of the law and in violation of, of policies. So um, I'm, I'm happy to take up what, what amounts to a large chunk of my time to stand up for my colleagues who have left and who are under criticism from members of this very subcommittee um, and to restate that there is a First Amendment. We have a right to criticize when there is evidence of wrongdoing. We have a responsibility to the taxpayers of this country when there are individuals within your agency who violate the rights of American citizens. And so I, I uh, needed to stand up for my colleague, uh, and I do want to, but I do want to ask, as part of FISA, I have an amendment that would codify a policy of the Bureau related to abouts collection. Abouts. So the, the FBI has decided not to engage in uh, what amounts to uh, collection of upstream communication from companies that operate internet cables that interconnect with ISPs local networks to include the collections of communications about a target. Um, you would, why did you all stop uh, about collection? Well, I will confess to you, it's been a little while since I looked at that issue. Uh, it was very much on our mind uh, back uh, around the time of the, um, the last reauthorization, as I recall. Um, I think, again, my memory's not perfect on this, but I, I think it was a judgment that the, um, that the benefits from having that uh, were outweighed by, in our view, the potential that... Um, the authority could result in a compliance violation of some sort. Do you have any I, again, I, my memory's a little fuzzy on that, so we, with that big caveat. Do you have an, any intention of resuming about collection at this time? N no. Uh, a, de a since declassified set of uh, FISA court opinions from 2011 shed a light on the pervasiveness of the collection at the time and noted that it resulted in uh, tens of thousands of holy domestic communications collected each year uh, due to what was described then as technical limitations in the implementation of, of a ballot collection. Um, so would it in any way interfere with department uh, policy or activities to codify the practice of the FBI and their suspension of, of a ballot collection? Well, I, again, without... I'd have to review any specific legislative proposal. Um, um, we have tried to put in place a whole range of policies and system enhancements, and I think uh, the effort on the, uh, and a number of the legislative reform proposals that are, are swirling around uh, up in Congress right now is are intended to, um, uh, similar language to what you're using, to sort of lock in uh, reforms that we've put in place, um, and I think w as a general matter, that's something that we're in favor of. But the specific issue, I'd have to take a closer look, but we're happy to do that. I appreciate that. Yield back. Does yeah. Mr. Rupp have yes, I want to respond to a couple of comments. First thing, recognized. let me say this. I respect everybody on this board. You have, on the, in this hearing, yeah, we all have different points of view. We look at things differently. Uh, but I also look at the big picture, too. My specialty throughout my life, most of it, um, other than being a county executive or something, has been law enforcement. And when you're in law enforcement, you, you, you're you trained, you develop relationships, and you learn a lot. And one of the most important things is for federal, state, and local, 
to work together. And I think that, that the comments that were made, and I respect that individual. I said that before I even talked about it. And I do respect him because he's a hard worker. He served at the Naval Academy. And I was just shocked that his whole, the whole f uh, five minutes or whatever he had, it was, it was in criticizing someone who I happen to respect. And I think a lot of other people respect who has one of the hardest jobs in America. What bothers me is that we are probably in one of the worst situations for national security in the history of our country. And he's a major part of dealing with those issues. And I would hope that someone with his expertise and smarts, and he's very smart, and I will talk to him personally because I know him personally, but that would, would spend doing this and not talk about what are we going to do with this issue, or this, which everyone else here has talked to him about. And I, I just was, was shocked. And, 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 and believe it, I get probably more heat from my left than I get from you all. And, and, but that's just my politics, and that's the way each one of us has our different point of view. Mr. Clyde, he didn't mind, in the beginning when he started, he asked good questions. He didn't, he didn't have the experience that some of us have in law enforcement or dealing with you all and that type of thing, but he, he, you tried. You, you wanted to know. You asked good questions, and, and I respect that. I don't, whatever your, your conclusion is, I respect it. I might not like it, but I respect it. So I just wanted to respond a little bit on why I felt it was really important to stand up for somebody who I think is qualified, uh, he's doing a good job, and the FBI has really, in my opinion, grown, and I love the fact that they're now working with federal, state, and local as a team, and that makes them a lot better. Gentlemen, you back. Yes, I do. That uh, concludes today's hearing. Uh, we want to thank our witness, Director Ray, for being here. Without objection, members may have seven days to submit additional questions for the record. The subcommittee now stands adjourned.